Oh yeah. End game there, you know the the Hergiolecki. Oh yeah, we're working. Uh, the Hergiolecki. Okay. Yo, how's it going, man? Welcome. You have a mic? I guess not. I hear you. Okay, let me know if, uh, if it gets better. Awesome. Sweet. Well, glad you could make it. Um, let's see what we've got. I've been reading a little bit on uh, Genesis 24, like I said. Uh, usually three or four, maybe, tops. I think uh, Godzilla said he'd come by a little later. Maybe I can make an announcement let everybody know where. Sorry, I'm just kind of getting settled in. Getting a beer and a cigar going. Got my Bible opened up. Let's see. Chapter 24. So I've got on the screen there uh, the King James, but 
the one I'm reading is uh, uh, New Standard Revised, like I said earlier. So sometimes uh, what I'm reading may be different than what's on the screen. Nice, yeah, I'm very interested in the uh, Jewish study Bible. Um, like I was kind of saying, what I got into this in the first place was um, just the history stuff in um, Chronicles and Kings um, and some of the books that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I've been, I don't know, pretty... Uh, I haven't read it all yet, so... I think what I like about it is the uh, historical stuff, which I guess is kind of what I'm looking for in the Bible. Obviously, I'm not going to find a whole lot in Genesis that's historical, but I think to make sense of all the later stuff, it would be good to have a good grasp of the earlier books. Um, and the Pentateuch itself has a lot of... A lot of history. It's very curious. Uh, I got a book around here somewhere. Who wrote the Bible? And um, that's all about the Pentateuch. So that's been a lot of fun. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, by Friedman. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I've read it, but now I'm using it like a cross reference. It was a great book. A lot of Jewish history that I didn't know. Yeah, I believe I agree with that. Um, kind of the same as like not crediting who the authors were or caring particularly who wrote the books. The idea that Moses wrote the the Torah was a relatively newer idea, uh, as far as I understand it, that came. Yeah, I bet. I uh, I meant to ask you earlier too. Um, do you know uh, the YouTube Henry Ab Abramson, I think, is it? Abramson? Um, okay, yeah. he. This guy, uh, let me show you what he looks like just to give you an idea if you're seeing my screen here. But he does uh, Jewish history, and it's really, really good. He's very funny. Um... There we go. Yeah, yeah, I'll post a link. He has a lot of really cool takes on the... Uh, the Jewish people and their movements, particularly around the Old Testament. Um, and he does a lot of just Jewish Jewish history, which I find fascinating. That's something that I'm not familiar with at all, uh, pre-World War, I guess. Uh, I was raised Catholic um, and my family is very devout, uh, they, you know, every one of them goes to church every weekend, um, and then I, when I was in boot camp in the Navy, I got pretty religious, I, at the time, thought God got me through some of the difficult, quote-unquote, times, um, but afterwards, uh, maybe four or five years after, I got out of the Navy, I was uh, had a roommate that was an atheist, and uh, I thought I was cool, I thought I was challenging him, and a lot of times you hear atheists are like, uh, prodding and asking a bunch of questions and pushing and stuff and trying to get you to change your religion, but he was just answering my questions more or less, um, 
and I kind of struggled with that a whole lot, coming up with answers or questions that he didn't have answers to and answering questions he had for me. Um, and eventually I, w I just had a eureka moment where it was like, uh, would it be possible, what would the world be like if there was not a God? And uh, I came to the realization that it would be exactly how it is now. Um, and so my process there was if uh, if it's possible to be this way without a god, then that has to be the way it is. Now, I guess that was my my finding of atheism, and that was uh, about a decade ago. Um, I read the Bible at that point, and I had like a Bible that I marked up. I put you know markouts and references and highlights and all kind of shit in there, like trying to say, oh, this is a contradiction, or oh, this is where you know, miracles happen, or angels aren't real, and all this stuff that I tried to like, point out in the Bible. Point being now, I've come back to it, looking at it more for what could be true, or what the historical context of it all was, so um, that's where I am now, is trying to reread it with uh, maybe a little bit more objective perspective. So yeah, the Jewish Study Bible is definitely um, an input that I would like. Uh, like I said, my perspective is, is Catholic, so it was a uh, pretty strict New Testament um, and the Catholic religion dogma that probably pushed me out of religion in the first place. But I've been absolutely fascinated with everything that I learned about the Jewish history. Uh, like, I, I knew about the exile, but I didn't really know what it was, and so finding out... Um, I guess that the uh, Babylonians came in and wiped out the city and carried everyone away. It was just, it's all kind of fresh to me. Yeah, I think a lot of people are scared of what they might find in the Old Testament. The other thing is there's a lot of, uh, I think when I looked at the Old Testament, I thought it was all just um, lists of people's names. <laughs> You know, like, uh, um, genealogies and long, drawn-out details about things that didn't matter. Yeah. Um, and now reading through, you know, I still find those pretty frequently in here, but right now, like in 24, I'm pretty excited about today. I just read up to, like, 32, um, and it's all Abraham, Isaac, and, uh, what is it, Joshua, um, and their stories, which I'm pretty fascinated with. It's all, like I said, a new perspective, so I'm excited for that stuff. And also, yeah, like you said, the Jewish stuff, and I'm also curious in the Quran, um, Quran, however you pronounce it, and uh, their perspective and changes on the stories, right? Like, for instance, um, it being Ishmael, who is... Uh, bound instead of Isaac. Welcome back. Glad you could make it. Yeah, nice, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. It's um, it's different for sure, if nothing else. It says in your roles that you're a theist. Can you describe a little bit more about your uh, 
upbringing and kind of what you believe or perspective, I guess? Welcome, wizard. Hello. How are you, man? Nah, bad day. Oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that. What's going on, Wizard? Are you okay? No, no, I'm on the... Yeah, I guess, yeah. I'm still a bit struggling with exhaustion from COVID, like, since October. Holy shit. So, um... I spent most of the day in bed today. It was not a good day. basically listed all these so I don't know if you caught wizard earlier we're uh, chapter 24 in Genesis right now we're kind of just discussing our backgrounds and perspectives a little bit yeah no problem I'm mostly listening and I'll probably leave early because I'm going to sleep early oh, I hear you man Maybe next week I'll ask if uh, more people would come if it was a little earlier. Find a yeah, good time for everybody. I know it's really hard. Yeah. It's a difficult exercise. Um, Maven is in the uh, voice without voice if you're reading along. Oh no, I'm not. Wait. Yeah, I uh, I get that the. Uh Academic biblical criticism. I think, uh, depending on how you read into it, yeah, there's definitely um, positives to be taken from it if you're religious. Whew. Pneumonia and then COVID. Wow. Oh yeah, well, I'll get better. Yeah, I hope so. Eventually. How old are you? 34. Okay. But like I'm still working and stuff, it's just like, by the end of the day I'm hammered. Yeah, yeah, I'm same age. I can hear that, yeah. I think there's a lot to be read here. A lot more than picking out 
quotes to uh, fit your narrative. Yeah, biblical, biblical criticism is extremely uh, interesting. Haven't read much about the Old Testament regarding criticism, though. Mostly about the New. Yeah, yeah, me too. Up until just recently, I think uh, I read misquoting Jesus, and you know that was pretty much my go-to biblical criticism reference. Um, yeah. But this uh, Oxford annotated Bible has a lot of really cool annotations. You know, it's like a study Bible. But they, you know, do cross references for different uh, translations of the Hebrew and uh, kind of break it up into stories and try to uh, maybe explain some of the underlying themes. So that's pretty fun. And it also references the different authors here in uh, the Pentateuch, the priestly and non priestly versions and such. Mm -hmm. So um, here today, like I said, we're on 24. Um, you guys can kind of, I think, see some of this over here. If you're seeing my screen. Oh, I guess it's not going to let me go any further. Okay. Um, let's see. I think I'll just read the study side of it because it gives a pretty good synopsis and we can read in the... Uh, verses that they particularly call out. So uh, starting with 24, 1 through 67, it's uh, referencing finding a wife for Isaac <clears throat> among the kinfolk in Haran. And I guess if I understand this correctly, that's where uh, um, Abraham's family was. Um, and there's a oath here. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his house, who had put charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of Canaanites, among whom I live. And apparently putting the hand under the thigh was an old form of oath-taking. It says it reflected the view that re reproductive organs were sacred. So if you made an oath with somebody, I guess you, I don't know, put your hand, I, I don't know if it's under, like, you sitting or under your thigh, like, while you're wearing a skirt type thing, you know? I don't mean to make that silly, but you know what I mean? Do they no. literally mean sit on the hand or... Anyway, it, it's immaterial. I just found that different for sure. Yeah. Um, and then it says here that the text describes a concern by Abraham about intermarriage with Canaanites that is otherwise seen primarily in late materials. Um, so this is an early, you can't marry these people rule, I guess. Um, let's see so going back to the actual text here um, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me back to this land must I then take your son back to the land from which you came and Abraham says no the Lord God in heaven who took me from my father's house and who spoke to me and swore to me to your offspring I will, have, I will give this land he will send this angel before you, and you shall take a wife from my son there. So he's sending a servant to go get his, his son a wife. And this is the whole story about that servant going back to... Uh, oh, where did it say? Haran. And he goes by a well. Let's see, verse 15... Let the girl to whom I shall say, please offer your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. And then he goes and he finds Rachel, right? Or Rebecca. Is this Rebecca? Yeah, Rebecca. Then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban.
And Laban is very great to this servant and says, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside when I have prepared the house and a place for your camels? So the man came into the house, and Laban unland, unloaded his camels, gave him straw and fodder for the camels, and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told my errand. So he asks for the daughter here in 34. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy, and he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son. You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. It's weird that they want to <laughs> intermarry into their family, I guess. Interesting. Yeah, I don't. Obviously, I don't see any names in here. Um, what is A and E? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely <laughs> a different time as far as uh, marriage is concerned. Uh, let's see, 34. Yeah, not uh, water down the line with the people that live there already. Bring his own kin. I came today to the spring and said, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make successful the way I am going, I am standing here by the spring of the water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman who the Lord has appointed for my master's son. A little bit of repetition. And yeah, they go through all of this uh, with Laban and they determined to let Rebecca decide whether she wants to go or not. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they rose in the morning, he said, Send me back to my master. Her brother and her mother said, Let the girl remain with us a while, at least ten days. After that she may go. But he said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has made my journey successful. Let me go, that I may go to my master. They said, We will call the girl and ask her. And they called Rebecca and said, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. And then they finally go and meet Isaac. Rebecca and Isaac. He took Rebecca and she became his wife and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted in his mother's death after his mother's death. Damn, that's a long uh, chapter. 67 verses. Yeah, very much so. I like that note you've got there, Maven. Um, I was thinking the same thing with Laban and when his uh, son-in-law comes back. Because I just read that, obviously, a few minutes ago when I was reading 30s. Um... And yeah, the materialistic, noticing the jewelry, the nose ring, I guess they gave her a nose ring. Did I read that right? I don't have a whole lot of notes in this part from my um, book here. It basically just describes the size of the uh, shekel, where Haran is, how that's related to Abraham, and the intermarriage with the Canaanites. Um, 
And then, if we're good to go into 25, we'll get the death of Abraham. Interesting. 2447, okay. So here he says... Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel. So I put the ring in her nose and the bracelets on her arms, and I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord. And then 22, 23. Was Bethuel became the father of Rebekah, who's eight Milkai. Moreover, this concubine, whose name was Ryuma, bore Taba. Oh, sorry, no, 23. 22:23. When the camels had finished the drink, the man took the gold nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her arms and said, Tell me whose daughter you are. Yeah, reversing the order, I got you. And then in 25, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him several more sons. I'm not going to read all. Several more generations listed here. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living, and he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward and into the east country. This is the length of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered by his people. And then they show the descendants of Ishmael. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names. Shows that he, God gave him his own nations, as promised. And then we get the descendants of Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. Isaac prayed to the Lord, for she was barren, and the Lord granted his, par his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Somewhere in here? Yeah. So already predicting the uh, Joshua Esau, or Jacob Esau, issue. This is such a fascinating part where the birthright is taken. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand gripping Esau's hill, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. And that is 25, 20. Um, yeah. This is priestly material. For the genealogy of Isaac, see the chart. The narrative presupposes any ancient practice of seeking a divine oracle. And then here's the part about the red. The Hebrew wor word for red, admoni, is a play on the word Edom. Harry is a play on Seir, the region of the Edomites. That's an interesting part of it. Uh, Maven, do you read Hebrew? I assume not ancient Hebrew, so you're not going to be able to read the uh, ancient text. But um, Jacob, which probably means may God protect, is interpreted here by a play on the Hebrew word for heel. He takes by the heel or he supplants. See Hosea 12.3. Yeah, me too. But man, I don't have the time to learn a whole other language, especially a dead one. Let's see if I can find Hosea quickly. Nope. Yeah, I'm not going to dig too much for that.
21. But it depends. Uh, we'll probably be on for a couple hours anyway. I usually run till about 5. What do you want, Coco? Get out of here. Uh, puts her in line with the succession to her late mother-in-law. Yeah, there's a whole lot of barrenness in God's people. Interesting, yeah. I, I love these times early in the Bible when people are asking God for things and he's doing it. Like when... Uh, Abraham asked God if he would spare Sodom and Gomorrah if there was at least, I don't know, what was it, 50 good people in there? Like negotiating with God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, these, uh... Um... Him. There's a name for them. I don't remember. Yeah, a lot of barrenness and a lot of famine. So 26 starts. Now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, and, oh, n nice. We go back to Abimelech. Um, I think Abraham tricked Abimelech by telling him that his wife, Sarah, was his sister, right? So he, here he's going to see the same thing again. Um, so Isaac settled in Gerar. Yeah. 26.6. When the man of the place asked him about his wife... She is my sister, for he was afraid to say that he is my wife. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man shall be put to death. He said, I've seen this play act out before. Isaac sowed seed in that land. Interesting, yeah, the, uh, yeah, I never thought about the younger son and the Ishmael Isaac, um, story, that, that definitely fits the same thing, um, yeah. Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us. You have become too powerful for us. That's my kind of life. Yeah, makes them stand out a little bit, right? So Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Isaac again dug wells of water that had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them up in the de after the death of Abraham. He gave them the names his father had given them, but when Isaac's servants dug in the valley, the herders of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herders. A lot of well digging. From there he went up to Beersheba, and that every, that very night the Lord appeared to him. I am the Lord, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you and will bless you and make your offspring numerous for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well.
Why? Ha oh, uh, Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, his advisor, and Fickle, the commander of his army. Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? And they said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we say, Let there be an oath between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, so that you do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So they made them a feast, and they ate and drank. In the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths, and Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. That same day Isaac's servants came and told him about the well that they had dug, and said to him, We have found water. He called it Sheba, for therefore the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. So that's like the third explanation for the name of Beersheba. I guess because they keep filling the well back up. Oh, nice. Yeah, one to five. Yeah, it's an interesting question I've had a lot of is uh, how Jewish was Abraham, right? Like, how much of the tradition did he follow or even implement, I guess? Abraham observed all categories of Jewish law, even the oral Torah. Only those commandments that have been communicated to him in Genesis or that human reason can intuit without revelation. That's the one I more fall in line with, I think. I would expect more that Abraham only did what he was told and was a good guy otherwise, right? I mean, that's as much as I can decipher. Again, I'm not familiar enough with the, uh, with the Torah rules and the smaller laws that they had to comment on anything that Abraham would have or could have done in that regard anyway. Uh, let's see, yeah, so we see here we've been through 2626. 26. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Mavin. Um, I'm, I'm definitely intrigued by the uh, Jewish Bible. Um, I was torn when I got this annotated Bible, whether to get the Jewish study Bible or this one. Um, but I found this one used and it was a good price, so I just picked it up. I probably should get the Jewish one as well soon. Oh, cool. You have a PDF? Yeah, um, that's what I understand as well. And not that far different, right? They're still like... The Pentateuch is all in the same order. I think the... They get different after that when it's prophets and uh, judges in this Bible and maybe the writings in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, at least that much, yeah. <sighs> when Esau was 40 years old, he married... Judith, daughter of Biri the Hittite. It's 34. And Basemath, <laughs> daughter of Elon the Hittite. And they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Interesting. I wonder why he made life bitter for Isaac and Rebecca. Okay. What is the Nevi'im and the Kutivim again? Is that the writings and something else? Isn't it like the rule, the writings, and the something else?
27 picks up uh, Isaac was old and his eyes were dim. My son, see I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons and quiver and bow and go out in the field and hunt game for me. Then prepare savory food such as I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may bless you before I die. Rebecca was listening. And she said to her son Jacob, I heard your father say to your brother, bring me game and prepare, prepare it for me. And she tells him, tells Jacob, to instead go grab some of her ewes and she will... Ah, prophets and writings. Yeah, there we go. Um, and she will prepare it the way that her, his father likes. Bacon, uh, Jacob said to his mother, Rebekah, Look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a man of smooth skin. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him, and bring a curse on myself, and not a blessing. His mother said, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my word, and go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them for his mother, and his mother prepared savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. And she put the skins of the kids on his hands on the smooth part of his neck. Then she handed the savory food and the bread she had prepared to her son Jacob. He went to his father and said, My father, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly? And he answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether or not you are truly my son Esau. So Jacob went up to his father Isaac, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, Bring it to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he came near and blessed him. Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your brothers' sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of his father, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He also prepared food and brought it to his father, and he said to his father, Let you sit up and eat of his son's game so that you may bless me. And his father said, Who are you? I am your firstborn son, Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently and said, Who is it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came, and I have blessed him. Bless the wrong son. Wrong boy, Dad. <laughs> then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, Let's See. I have already made him your Lord, and I have given him all his brothers as servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing? Bless me also. Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then his father Isaac answered him, See away from the fatness of the earth shall, be, shall your home be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you break loose, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of this blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Whew. By screwing over Abraham, you mean taking the uh, blessing meant for his 
I guess, grandson, for Abraham's grandson and stealing it away. Yeah, basically. Like. Yeah, yeah, he stole it from uh, Esau. Wait, the elderly really man was the son of Abraham, or? Yes, yeah, Isaac uh, is the old man in this story. Um, so oh, Isaac, okay. So Isaac he, intended so he, to bless his son Esau, and Jacob swooped in and stole it. So he basically screwed over Isaac, and Isaac doesn't seem to care. Yeah, exactly. Nor does God, really, because uh, God will come down in a minute and bless Joshua himself. Or Jacob, I'm sorry, I keep getting confused, Jacob and Joshua. Huh. Uh, and that's nice. Let's see. 27, 34 through 5. Was that what we were just doing? 34. Uh, <coughs> yeah, 27, 34. When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me also, father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Yeah, and I think uh, part of what this is about is later um, Israel will dominate Edom. Is that what I remember correctly? It's all about uh, setting up um almost a caste system, right? Like the Israelites are dominant over all the other nations. And the reason is because God told us, you know, a hundred years ago when our great, great grandparents were here, that this was how it was going to be. Ah, yeah, that's right. It does say that in here as well, actually. Um, 27. Yeah, so here it says, The blessing was believed to release a power that could not be redacted. There is wordplay in Hebrew for my birthright, Bekarati, and my blessing, Berkati. So it's a little play on words there. And then it says an inversion of the same words in 39. C and D. Yeah, just different uh, translations on the blessing he gave. So going back to uh, Esau saying he wants to kill him. Uh, but the words of her elder son Esau were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, Your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. Now therefore obey my voice. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away. Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women, such as these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? <laughs> my whole life will be ruined if uh, my son marries a Hittite. <laughs> Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him, You shall not marry one of the Canaanite women. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take his wife from there, one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. 
<coughs> may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and numerous that you may become a company of peoples. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel, brother of Rebekah. Esau receives a blessing that is formidable but inferior. Interesting, yeah. Uh, ninth or eighth centuries, okay. Yeah, let's go check that out. I'm very curious in the Kings and Chronicles, so. You've got here Kings 8-2. Uh, kings, 1 Kings. Eight. Oh, two kings. So bad. Sorry. Yeah, two kings. Two kings. Two kings. Eight. All right. Let's just go ahead and read a little bit of eight. So it says two kings. Eight twenty. Let's start 8.16. Let's start of the paragraph. In the fifth year of King Joram, son of Ahab of Israel, Jehoram, son of King Jeshaphat of Judah, began to reign. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. He walked away in the way, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as the house of Ahab had done, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for the sake of his servant David, since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his descendants forever. Here's 20. In the days Edom revolted against their rule of Judah and set up a king of their own. Then Joram crossed over the Zair with all his chariots. He set out by night and attacked the Edomites and their chariot commanders who had surrounded him. But his army fled home. So Edom has been in revolt against the rule of Judah to this day. Libna also revolted at the same time. And then 2 Chronicles 28.17. These are fun little stories of battles and shit. <laughs> 28.17. Okay, 28.16. At that time, King Ahaz sent to the king of Assyria for help, for the Edomites, Edomites had again invaded and defeated Judah and carried away captives, and the Philistines had made raids on the cities of Shephala and the Negeb of Judah, Negeb of Judah, and had taken Beth, Beth Shemesh, Aijalon, a bunch of cities, Timnah, and Gimjo, and they settled there. For the Lord brought Judah low because of King Ahaz of Israel, for he had behaved without restraint in Judah and had been faithless to the Lord. Yeah, a lot of bad kings. But I love those references where it's like, just go look over in Kings and you'll see how this is reflected back in Genesis. Oh, okay, that was... 27 and 29, 28. Okay, yeah, so now we're picking back up where Esau uh, in 28.6. When now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padam, Padan Aram to take a wife from there, and that as she, he blessed him, he charged him, You shall not marry one of the Canaanite women. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please his father Isaac, Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, daughter of Abraham's son Ishmael, and sister of Nebaioth to be his wife in addition to the wife he, wives he had. Interesting. <coughs> Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, came to a certain place and stayed there for a night. And he dreamed that there was a ladder... So, uh, real quick, I've heard of Jacob's Ladder. Is this what they're referring to? Is this story here? Because I don't see a whole lot of reference here to what... I don't know what Jacob's Ladder is other than the dick piercing. 
But I know I've heard reference to Jacob's Ladder. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place. Taking one of the stones of the palace, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reaching to heaven. And the gods, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread across abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring know that i am with you and i will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for i will not leave you until i have done what i have promised you now let's see what my annotation says here And it picks up in 12. The earliest version of this oracle described divine messengers, angels, ascending and descending a stairway. This is reflected in verse 17. Verse 17. Oh, okay, yeah, that's the... He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. According to most source critics, is the combination of J and E is the continuation of 2745 and records Jacob's first direct encounter with God. Yeah, stairway. It says here that a stairway is a better translation than a ladder. Yeah, very much the ziggurats. They came up a lot um, in our earlier conversations of Ur, where uh, Abraham was from. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I like that the stairway, like a ziggurat, up to God, like the Tower of Babel kind of thing. Then it says, 13 to 15, God's appearance here is awkwardly linked to the preceding stairway vision. Therefore, many scholars see another authorial hand here, adding the Abrahamic promise to an early Bethel narrative that lacked it. So let's see what my version here. So I put which author wrote what. My who wrote the Bible says this is all a priestly encounter. Ah, no. Yeah, there's uh, Yahwistic comes in. 2810, which is exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, so, yeah, it's an interchanging of uh, Yahwistic and, uh, let's see, Eloistic. Look how much they jump back and forth in just these, where we go to here, to 17... Yeah, a lot of interchanging of the authors. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree, Maven. Uh, this guy, Friedman, he's pretty adamant about driving the difference in the two, but you're right. Yeah, the J and E, uh, they're both so goddamn old, man. Like, uh, let's see. I think that my timeline shows J and E kind of overlap each other just a little bit here. Let's see. Come on, why can't... There we go. Yeah, so E may have been marginally earlier. But both would have been uh, before Israel was, was destroyed. The northern kingdom, that is. Interesting, yeah. Um, I think that who wrote the Bible kind of tries to say that there I, I think you were talking about this earlier actually in your um, uh, Jewish study Bible that it was the three books I think one of your links up there talked about it was uh, J E and P and then D picks up Deuteronomy and then who wrote the Bible this uh, Friedman guy says Deuteronomy Joshua and a few other books after that were all written by the same scribe so rather than the Pentateuch being a group, it should be the first four books, and then the next three or four books would be a different author.
Alrighty, wizard, thanks for coming by. Um, what do you mean by the misrepresentation? Do you think rather than a scribe, it was a uh, maybe more like a tribe or a group of like a council maybe is more kind of how I've viewed these I guess I just say scribe as a placeholder maybe I don't obviously can't tell who how many people were writing yeah okay I could hear that yeah compilers redactors a lot like um, oh who was uh, the great scribe I know Esther was good, but Ezra. Right, yeah, they were um, different times, obviously. Like, the, I think Eve wrote before the fall of, or the civil war between the northern and southern kingdoms, right? Or at least some of it. And again, like you said, referring to them as singular authors is uh, a mischaracter mischaracterization. Oh man, this is fun. I'm really enjoying uh, so so far how we've gotten. Um, if we go ahead and... Oh yeah, let's finish out 28 I think, right? So that was where Jacob's Ladder came in. Um, and then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So my notes here say the promise to Jacob here after his split from Esau is similar to the promise to Abraham just after his split from Lot. In the formulation of these promises, oh, uh, see 12, 1 through 13. 12, 1, god damn, we're going way the fuck back here. So what does it say here? See, 12, 1 to 3 in. 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Yeah, so that's almost a direct, <laughs> direct copy of that story. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Bethel became Jerusalem, right? Do I remember that correctly? They. Uh... Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought that uh, Jerusalem was placed on top, placed on another city. Did they destroy one city and name it Jerusalem? We'll get there, surely. But um, if we pick up where we left off here, let's see. Okay, yeah, this is setting up the uh, tithing, I think, if I am reading this correctly. Uh, so picking up on verse 18, it says, Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Lutz at first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give you one-tenth. Then we'll pick up chapter 29. When Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of his people in the east, as he looked, he saw a well in the field and three flocks of sheep laying there beside it. 
Uh, when the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? They said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, son of Nahor? They said, We do. He said to them, Is it well with him? Yes, they replied. Here is his daughter Rachel coming with the sheep. He said, Look, it is still broad daylight. It is not time for the animals to be gathered together. Water the sheep and let them go. Uh, and go pasture them. Let's see. I don't know if you uh, like reading along or if you're reading along in your own version here, but let's see. 29... Uh, four, so we're somewhere about here. I got you, yeah, totally. Um, sorry, I just like having a reference up in case anybody else might read along with this. Um, uh, look, here comes Rachel. We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we can water the sheep. While he was speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep. Now when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of his mother's brother Laban, Laban, and the sheep of his mother's brother, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud, and Jacob told Rachel that he was his father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. Um, and then we go back to see Laban in, yeah, here's 15 where I'm at about the wages. Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing, tell me what your wages shall be. Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah and then Leah maybe, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man, so stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. All right, I'm going to skim my notes here and see if I see anything pops out for me. Let me know if you have anything in your Jewish study Bible. Welcome back, Bat. Um, let's see. Jacob's marriages. Yeah, okay, so. Wells often serve as meeting places in the cultures of the Near East. The Bible describes several such well scenes in 24 and Exodus 2. Uh, it says here, 4 and 5. What was 4 and 5? Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? And they said, We are from Haran. C twenty four ten. Twenty four ten. We are uh, chapter twenty nine, verse about fifteen, and we're uh, just glancing over our study Bibles real quick to see if there's any notes here about what we've got. Um, oh, God damn it! Lost my page. Uh, twenty four ten. Oh, see the notes. Twenty-four ten, the upper Euphrates region of Syria, in which Haran, Abraham's original home, was located. Okay, so they're just saying uh, this is taking place in Syria, modern day, I guess Syria. Um, then, verse ten, Jacob, the folk hero, has superhuman strength by removing that uh, rock. In verse eighteen, Jacob asks for Rachel as a reward for service instead of paying the usual marriage price. It says we can uh, reference Joshua 15 or Samuel 17 for that reward for service. Joshua 15. Let's see. That shouldn't be too far. Joshua 15, verse 16 and 17. And Caleb said, whoever attacks Kiriath Sefer and takes it to him, I will give my daughter. Okay. So that's just uh, prices they were paying for wives, I think. Interesting. Explicit references to romantic love.
That's very interesting. You would think that uh, as much... Um, I guess the Tanakh is obviously a much different book than the whole Bible, but as much as they say the profession of love or what have you. Right, yeah. And that's, again, referencing what you brought up earlier, the Torah, the Nevim. Yeah, exactly, Ketavim. Yeah, perfect. By the way, if you're not following uh, Bat, we are uh, in the... Oh, yeah, you're in the chat, obviously. Um, I think that pretty much covers my notes here. Oh, yeah, we're about to get into the trickery. Um, yeah, Laban had two daughters. When Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go in to her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered all the people and made a feast. But in the event... Even in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. When morning came, it was Leah, and Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why have you deceived me? My notes here say, Here is Jacob the trickster being tricked. This motif will continue throughout the Jacob story. The exchange could be made because the bride was brought veiled to the bridegroom. And I think that you're saying that that also happened for, uh... Oh, for their father, Isaac. She came out veiled as well, uh, Rebecca. Um, and then, let's see. Laban said, this is not done in our country, given the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for severing me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. And the week here is referring to a bridal uh, marriage festivity. Ah, yeah, the response of 26, what we just said, right, was that the firstborn, the younger before the firstborn is an exact... Ironic reaffirmation. <laughs> and I find it funny that they call it harsh labor here. I mean, I don't know how hard uh, shepherding is, but I don't know. I, I don't guess he was a slave. I don't know what the harsh labor, maybe there's something more there than I know about. He brings up later that none of uh, Laban's animals died. And any time they were sick, uh, Jacob took the debt for them. Uh, so he got Rachel and it says, So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah, Leah received and bore a son, and she named him Reuben. For she said, Because the Lord has looked on me if, on my affliction, surely now my husband will love, me, will love me. She conceived again and bore a son, and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. She named him Simeon. I don't know if I can hold this chart up. There's a pretty good chart here in my book. Doubtful I can get it readable for you guys. But anyway, they just show all the kids and all the wives that Jacob had. So Jacob married Leah first, right? Who he did not love. And then he married Rachel, who he did love. And Leah had, gave a bunch of kids. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven children. And uh, Rachel will give some more children. We'll give two, but much later in the story. So let's see here. She conceived again. Uh, speaking of Leah, obviously, she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, his name shall be Judah. Then she ceased bearing. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister, and she said to Jacob, Give me children, or I shall die. Jacob became angry with Rachel and said, I, Am I in the place of God, who has withheld you from the, 
withheld from you the fruit of the womb. Then she said, Here is my maid, Bilhah. Go in her, that she may bear upon my knees, and that I too may have children through her. So she gave him her maid, Bilhah, as a wife, and Jacob went into her, and Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, I shall name him Dan. Ironically, my dad's name. That is uh, D. That he is judged is the name. Interesting. Rachel's maid, Bila, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she, she named him Nef Neftali. Okay, and that uh, Neftal is to wrestle. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her maid Z Zilpah and gave him gave her to Jacob. And Zilpah, Zilpah bore Jacob a son. God damn, this Jacob guy is just pumping him out. Oh, I guess that's where the twelve tribes come from, right? So makes sense. Uh, and then we'll go down to verse 14, chapter 30, verse 14. Sorry, falling a little bit behind here. Verse 14. In the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field, brought them to his mother Leah. Rachel said to Leah, please, please give me your son's mandrakes. He had a lot about mandrakes. I guess she traded mandrakes for sex? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, Then he may lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. Okay, yeah. Jacob came from the field in the evening. Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he laid with her that night. And God heeded Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my hire because I gave my maid to my husband. So she named him Issachar. Yeah, there's a lot of kids. Jumping down to 22. God remembered Rachel, and God heeded her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bore a son, and said, God has taken away my reproach. Named him Joseph. When Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my own home country. Give me my wives and my children, for whom I have served you, and let me go. But Laban said to him, If you will allow me to say so, I have learned by divination that the Lord God has blessed you. Name your wages, and I will give it. Yeah, so he gets cheated again. He said, What shall I give you? And Jacob said, You shall not give me anything if you will do this for me. I will again feed your flock and keep it. 31. Yeah, I read that also. Yeah, the mandrakes were an aphrodisiac. Okay, so I guess... Uh, what? Um, Rachel got the mandrakes in order to... Uh, be fertile for um, Jacob and resulted in Joseph so I guess they worked um, let me pass through all your flock today removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and such shall be my wages Every one that is not speckled and spotted amongst the goats and black amongst the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Laban said, Good, let it be as you have said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it, and every lamb that was black, and put them in the charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days' journey between him and Jacob, while Jacob was pasturing the rest of Laban's flocks. Yeah, no worries, Maven. Thanks for coming by. See you when you get back. The Jacob... Then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plain and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the rods. I don't understand this. I guess uh, maybe I can find some more reflection here in the notes. But he's separating them with these rods and having them breed. 
He set the rods that he had peeled in front of the flocks of the troughs, that is, the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the rods, and so the flocks produced young that were striped, fleck, speckled, and spotted. Ah. So my notes here for 25 through 40, let's read through the rest of 43 so the notes make sense. Um, the flocks bred in front of the rods, and so the flocks produced young that were striped, speckled, and spotted. Excuse me. Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and completely black animals in the flock of Laban. And he put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob laid the rods in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the rods. But for the feebler of the flock, he did not lay them there. So the feebler were Laban's, and the stronger were Jacob's. Thus the man grew ex exceedingly rich and had large flocks, male and female slaves, and camels and donkeys. My notes say, The birth of Jacob's flocks. Since striped or speckled coloration was unusual, Laban seemingly had nothing to lose. Ancient breeders believed that the female, at the time of conception, was influenced by visual impressions that affect the color of the offspring. Jacob pr produced striped animals by putting striped sticks before the female's eyes while they were breeding. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, makes sense in the context of the ancient Near East, I guess. Alright, I gotta go take a leak. I'll be right back. Apologies. Here, I can play a little video while I'm gone. Hello, fellow students in Jewish history. I assume I'm you guys can hear that okay. To go on with our Jewish History Lab lectures. We're going to look now at Genesis in historical perspective. I'm, of course, speaking about the biblical book of Genesis. And I've got to say one thing just to start out. You know, I would love to go through the entire book of Genesis. In fact, the entire Tanakh. And just speak about it as a, a work of tremendous power. If you have not read Genesis, and in fact, if you have not read the entire Bible, just stop watching right now and go get a copy of the Bible. They're available online and read it because it is phenomenal. It's incredibly important. It has so much, you know, power as a as a moral document, as a as a spiritual document, as a, a you know a transformational document, and even if you're not Jewish, even if you're not a monotheist, if you're a, you know, a, a Buddhist or a Hindu or an alligator, I don't know. I think you will find a tremendous amount of value in this incredibly important work that is really at the foundation of Western civilization. I'm going to just speak very briefly about the plot line of Genesis um, with the assumption that you have some broad familiarity with it. And this brief lecture in no way should replace general cultural familiarity with this very important document. Okay, let's begin by going to the biblical narrative itself. As we approach the biblical narrative, it's really important for us to recall oh. something that we discussed in the last lecture, and that is that in the world... Sorry, you um, can't hear anything. Well, no good that did, I guess. Ooh. How are you doing, bad? Doing good. Awesome, man. You following along? Today, okay? uh, Bible study in middle school once, but it was only for a few weeks, so haven't not really used to. Don't really know, you know, what's supposed to happen. And yeah, I don't know either. How it's I'm supposed to go. As I go. <laughs> yeah, good for you. I'm curious, and I have to imagine there are other people curious like me, you know. Um, mm -hmm. 
I looked for YouTube videos for something like this, and I keep finding things like this guy I'm showing you now, this Henry Abramson. They're pretty scholarly, uh, <laughs> looking for something a little more amateur. So I'm doing it myself. Nice. And I'm appreciating all the input from everybody. I know this guy, Maven, uh, he said he's, uh, I think, liberal Jew or uh, he had another term for it I think but so he's got some Jewish perspective and he's given these um, notes from the Jewish study Bible yeah his annotations have been yeah pretty great nice yeah um, so yeah like I said we are chapter 29 I don't know how long you've been kind of following along but Getting into some pretty good stories about the Abraham's children. This here, Joshua, or Jacob, sorry, man, I keep fucking that up. Too many J's. And I guess we're about to 31 now. Yeah. So the notes here say Jacob's departure from Laban's family. So 31. <clears throat> Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's. He has gained all his wealth from what belonged to our father. Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him as favorably as he did before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your ancestors and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah that were in the field where his flock was and said to them, I see that your father does not regard me as favorably as he did before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. If he said the speckled be your wages and then all the flock bore speckled, and if he said the stripe shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. It's God's fault, not mine. During the mating of the flock, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw that the male goats had leaped upon the flock, were striped, speckled, and mottled, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, here I am. And he said, Look up and see that all the goats that leap on the flock are striped, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and return to the land of your birth. Rachel and Leah answered him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has been using up the money given for us. All the property that God has given away from your father, from our father, belongs to us and to our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household goods. And Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he fled with all that he had. Starting out, he crossed the Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled, so he took his kinsfolk with him and pursued him for seven days until he caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the, Arama the Aramean in the dream by night and said to him, Take heed that you, do not, that you say not a word to Jacob, either good or bad. Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his kinfolks camped in the hill country of, of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You have deceived me and carried away my daughters like captives of the sword. Why did you flee secretly and not tell me? I would have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre. Why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? What, ha what you have done is foolish. It is in my power to do you harm, but the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Take heed that you speak to Jacob neither good or bad. 
Even though you had to go because you longed greatly for your father's house, why did you steal my goods? It says here, God. Surely that's a misprint. The household gods. No, yeah. May have been figures representing ancestral deities. Possession of them ensured leadership of the family and legitimate, legitimated property claims. Here, Jacob's favored wife, Rachel, is the trickster. She stole the gods. So Laban went in Jacob's tent and to Leah's tent and into the tent of the maids, but did not find them. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. So he searched and did not find the gods. Then Jacob became angry and umbraided Laban. Jacob said to Laban, What is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Although you have felt about all of my goods, you have found... What have you found of your household gods? Set it here before my kinsfolk and your kinsfolk so that we may decide between us. These twenty years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. Uh, going on and on about how good he did him. And then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters. Let's get down to 43. But what can I do today about these daughters of mine, about their children whom they have borne? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be witness between you and me. So Jacob set a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsfolk, Gather stones. Then they take, took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jegar Shahadutha, but Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, he called it Galid, and the pillar Mispath. Mispath. For he said, The Lord watch me when you are absent from one another. If you ill treat my daughters, or if you take wives in addition to my daughters, though no one else is with us, remember that God is witness between you and me. Let's see, notes here. The way of women is menstruation. I think I could figure that out. The Hebrew word rendered as fear in the fear of Isaac is different from the Hebrew word usually used for fear of the Lord. The same word clearly means terror or dread elsewhere, as in terror of the Lord. Some scholars, however, have proposed alternative understandings of the word in this context, such as refuge of Isaac. Interesting. And then 43, the story is built around an older tradition regarding a boundary covenant between Aramaeans and Israelites, both of whom laid claim to the region of Gilead in northern Transjordan. On the pillar, see 2818. Yeah, we already talked about the pillar, yeah. The stone heap is given two names, one in Laban's language of Aramaic and one in Jacob's name of Hebrew. All right, back to the text, 51. So we're picking up somewhere here. Then Laban said to Jacob, See this heap and see this pillar, which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor and the God of the Father judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. And Jacob offered sacrifice on the height and called his kinsfolk to the bread and they ate bread and tarried all the night in the hill country. Early in the morning Laban rose up and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them and then he departed and returned home. So that uh, fear of Isaac could also be translated as refuge of Isaac. I guess I didn't change it a whole lot. 32. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, "God, This is God's camp. So he called the place Mahanaim. Here taken to mean two camps. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have lived with Laban as an alien and stayed until now. 
I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, males, uh, male and female slaves, and I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. The messengers return and told Jacob, we, come to your we came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you with 400 men. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided his people that were with him into two companies, thinking if Esau comes to one company and destroys it, the other company is left will escape. Jacob said, O God, my father of Abraham, or God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, return to your, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of your steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed the Jordan. Now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers and the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good, and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. So he spent the night there, <clears throat> and from what he had with him, he took a present to his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk, milk camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. Thus he delivered into the hand of his servants every drove by itself and said to his servants, Pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the foremost, When Esau my brother meets you and asks you, To whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my lord Esau, and moreover he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and third and all who followed in droves, you shall say the, name thing, the same thing to Esau when you meet him, and you shall say, Moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterwards I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself spent that night in the camp. Are you following along here on the uh, stream, or do you have your own Bible you're following? Or are you just listening? Um, I was trying to download. I don't have any Bible. Uh, or you, I was so I was trying to download a version onto my computer, but I was having trouble navigating it and getting to the right place. So I've just been following along on the stream. All right. Um, I'm posting. A, I like this Bible Hub. <clears throat> um, I think yeah. At the top of the page here, you can show which book you want to go to. Um, so. See, I think what are we on? Genesis 32, and then they've got different uh, notes and translations here, commentaries. Um, I think you can also just pick out, you know, like different versions. What are we using? Um, I don't even see a new standard revised. English Standard, maybe? Anyway, there's a bunch of versions here that if you wanted to... Yeah, cool. Thanks. No problem. Um, I'll also, like I said, try to keep it up on the stream. I just It's tough to keep up while I'm reading. Um, what verse are we on? Genesis 32? Yes, yeah, we're uh, just finishing 31. I think... Uh, yeah, we're on 32. We just finished 31. Um, take that back. We're at thirty-two, thirteen. Nope. Scratch that. Thirty-two, twenty-two. We just read thirty, uh, thirteen, because that was when he uh, sent his presence ahead of him. Twenty-two picks up. The same night, he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, 
Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it you ask my name? And here and there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israels do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Interesting, I didn't know that. I wonder if that's still the case. Um, which version are you reading from? I picked in, the uh, King James version. Okay, yeah, I'm in new, uh, new Revised Standard Version, but the King James is what I have here on the screen. Yeah, I think following, uh, if I can find the new revised, it'd be easier, since, yeah. you know, some of the words are just slightly different. Yeah, I don't know, um, there's another Bible page I have here, maybe, uh, let's see, is there a new revised in here? Ah, here we go. Genesis 33. Let's see if it shows. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him. Yeah, it looks like it's the same version, so. All right, awesome, thanks. No problem. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in the front and then Leah with her children and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And finally Joseph and Rachel drew near and they bowed down. Esau said, What do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, To find favor with you, my lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, No, please. If I find favor with you, then accept my present from my hand. For truly, to see your face is like seeing the face of God since you have received me with such favor. Please accept my gift that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have everything I want. So he urged him and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us journey on our way, and I will go alongside you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail and the flocks and herds which are nursing are a care to me. And if they are overdriven for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant and I will lead on slowly according to the, p the pace of cattle that are before me and according to the pace of the children until I come upon my Lord's servant. So Esau said, Let me leave with you some people who are with me. But he said, Why should my Lord be so kind to me? So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed to Succoth where, and built himself a house and made booths for his cattle, therefore the place is called Sukkoth. What is that one? Um, A, that is booths? Interesting. Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Paddan Aram, and he camped there before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he brought for 100 pieces of money, the plot of land on which he had pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Eloah Israel, that is, God, the God of Israel. Um, then we pick up with Dina, chapter 34. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne Jacob, 
went out to visit the women of the region. When Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the region, saw her, he seized her and lay with her by force, and his soul was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl to be my wife. Now Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his cattle in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him, just as the sons of Jacob came in from the field. When they heard of it, the men were indignant and very angry because he had committed an outrage in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The heart of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give him to her, give her to him in marriage. Make marriages with us, give your daughters to us, and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall live with us, and the land shall be open to you. Live and trade in it, and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor with you, and whatever you say to me I will give. But the, put the marriage present and gift as high as you like, and I will give whatever you ask me. Only give me the girl to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled his sister Dinah. They said to him, We cannot do this thing, to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you, that you will become as we are, and every male among you be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take, our da take your daughters for ourselves, and we will live among you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take your daughter and be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing, because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored among his family. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These people are friendly with us. Let them live in the land and trade in it, for the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will they agree to live with us, to become one people, that every male among us is to be circumcised, as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their animals be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will live among us. And all who went out of the city gate heeded Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. On the third day, when they were still in pain, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords and came against the city unaware of killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword, and took Dina out of Shechem's house and went away. And the other sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city, because their sister had been defiled. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys and whatever was in the city and the field, all their health and all their little ones and their... all their wealth, excuse me, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in their houses, they captured and made their prey. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me, making me odious to the inhabitants of land of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My number are few. If, if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, Should our sister be treated like a whore? That's a pretty good story. So 33.18 to Kind of wild. Yeah, yeah, 33, 35.5. So let's go ahead and finish 35.5 at least so we get all these notes, I guess. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and settle there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come and let us go up to Bethel that I may make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak that was near Shechem. As they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities all around them so that no one pursued them. So our notes say, <clears throat> The stay in Shechem and the rape of Dina. Shechem was an important town in early Israel and one of the first capitals of the northern kingdoms. Northern Kingdom, excuse me. Here and in 34, Shechem is a personal name. Else, elsewhere in Genesis, the story portrays in the guise of individuals relationships between Israel and non-Israelite groups. The name of the altar, El, may be another reflection of the, Israel, of the worship of El in early Israel. 
El was another god, right? It was a, another Near East god. 34. In its broader context, this story explains why Simeon and Levi, two of Jacob's older sons, did not receive the highest blessings. Uh, verse 2, C3319, lay with her by force, meaning he raped her, though some scholars interpret the Hebrew verbs as suggesting illicit sexual intercourse rather than rape. Committed in outrage in Israel is an old expression for ultimate offenses such as violations of the sexual honor of the tribal group, a ban on the booty of holy war and the sanctity of hospitality. 8 to 12, Israelite law stipulates that a man who has sex with an unbetrothed woman must, re must retroactively marry her by paying her father a high marriage price. This narrative either does not recognize this law or assumed it does not apply outside the people of Israel. 13 to 17, Jacob's sons are now the tricksters. On circumcision, I'll oh, see chapter 17. 21 to 23, in contrast to Hamor's proposal to the Israelites of intermarriage and acquisition of land, his speech to his countrymen here betrays an interest in impoverishing the Israelites through assimilating them. On concern about intermarriage, see verse 24. Or chapter 24, excuse me. Uh, 25 and 26, Simeon and Levi lead the killing and recapture of Dina because, as older full brothers of Dina, they were responsible for avenging the violation of their family's honor. 27 and 29, in a reversal of what the Shechemites had planned for them, the Israelites take all the Shechemites' possessions. 30 to 31, Jacob is depicted here as less concerned about family honor than about good rel relations with the Canaanites. His son's question is left unanswered at the end of the story, but is ultimately addressed in 49.5. What was the question? Oh, should our sister be treated like a whore? Okay. It says it will be answered in... 49. Let's go see what that is. 49.5. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. May I never come into their council. May I not be joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and at their whim they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Interesting. Okay. Uh, the present narrative reflects a later judgment on non yahwistic ritual objects, like its parallels... It may presuppose, however, a more ancient practice of burial of divine images in sacred places, i.e. by a sacred tree. Jacob's fears proved to be unfounded. Okay. I think that's about good for me. It's uh, two hours today. and go a little longer if you like, but um, I feel like that's a pretty good stopping point. We can pick up on 35 next week. All right. Yeah, um, that works for me. Yeah. I appreciate you coming by. Um, yeah, thanks for doing this. What do you think, man? Is it working out for you all right? You having fun with it? Is it worth continuing? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I missed the previous um, studies, and I've never read the Bible, and I'm not even familiar with too many of the stories because I wasn't raised religious or anything, so it's all kind of new to me. But, yeah, it's interesting, and I'm glad you're doing this. Awesome, man. I really appreciate that. I'll uh, keep it going. Cool. I'll make a note next week. Hopefully do the same time, but kind of depends on what comes up, obviously. Mm -hmm. I'll make a post or what have you. Again, man, thanks for coming by. I'll check you out next week. Yeah, see you. Later.